everybody, Kevin Burmeister again. Uh, I'm going to provide you a link to the previous discussion, um, the slide here on the bottom left hand corner, so that you can access that information about Mount, Mount Moriah and get some context about what we're about to talk about over here. So uh, on the eastern side approaching the Kidron Valley is this double walled structure and this fortress goes back about 1400 BCE, uh, about the time that Israel was rising up out of Egypt. Uh, it was built over quite some time and we, we, we can see various modifications to it, but for most, of the t for most of the time water flowed from the Gihon Spring, which was located here on the northern side of this complex, uh, out into the valley floor. And we know that by the um, excavations that have occurred uh, that we can follow at various points in time in history. So, so at some point uh, that water was channeled further into the mountain and in fact 600 years or so after this uh, complex was first built at King Hezekiah cha successfully channeled the water all the way through the mountain to the uh, Shiloach pool the pool of Siloam um, which was inside or just out just on the inside of the city walls but uh, we're going to focus on a period of time that actually goes back before any of this existed and we're going to try to find out why this structure was built at this point here and why the double wall structure cut the mountain entirely from the north to the south so that it made the top section of the mountain impassable. And at the top here, you can see in this circle uh, is the Temple Zero complex that was discovered by Elie Shukran in 2009. Uh, here is that complex and it's four rooms. In those four rooms, there are some very, very important artifacts. One artifact in particular that we're going to focus on here today. Uh, here is a, a, an altar platform, uh, which we can see in this location. That altar platform is well known according to the Bible, uh, according to Jewish practices, uh, that every single altar is built on bedrock. Um, on earth or bedrock specifically and then um, uh, it's so that it's connected in order to purify to keep it remain pure um, anything that's uh, in bedrock is always going to be uh, in its pure state so so uh, up in this section was built a, uh, a copper or some kind of an altar section that's rested on that platform and on that um, uh, altar sacrifices were offered. Now those sacrifices were were, pro were uh, slaughtered, processed over here. The fats from the diaphragm moved onto the altar, offered on the altar. This is a liquids channel for wine, uh, for blood uh, that would have run from the sacrifice. Uh, this here is most likely a um, a, a vessel stand so that blood from the sacrifice would have been um, uh, stood in a vessel. The vessel was a tipped vessel so that it, it, it would have tipped over if it didn't have somewhere to rest in the, the base of the uh, bedrock. And uh, this here is a flower press. This here is an oil press. So, so really fully equipped for sacrificial offerings. But the, the particular focus here is this object, which is known as a matseva. You can see here it is in its uh, plexiglass box, um, protected. But the, the matseva that exists is the only artifact that, that, that has been preserved on this, uh, in this complex for the past um, at least s several thousand years, um, going back, uh, you know, three and a half thousand years uh, or more. So um, this matseva, uh, which stands um, in this room by itself, um, uh, we were Jews were prohibited from uh, um, making a covenant with God by anointing a stone matseva. It is not a gravestone. It is a stone that commemorates a covenant with God, and that stopped at the end of the forefathers Jacob, um, Isaac, and Abraham. There were no more offerings, no more covenants made with a standing stone. So if indeed this construction, which we know is three and a half thousand years old, um, based on findings at the base of the uh, quarry here, 
um, if we know it goes back that far, it, then, then this temple structure, um, according to Eli Shukran, um, and certainly uh, his view is that it predates this structure, and, um, and I share that view. Now, the question is really, why would they have built this entire complex here? Was it really to protect the water? Certainly, the early parts of the complex were not to protect the water. So then why would you have built it in the first instance? Uh, um, and and, and, and here's, a, here's a view that I hold, um, that the structure was actually built not just to protect the water, but also to obfuscate the mountain, to block the mountain, to stop people coming to Temple Zero. Now, if Temple Zero was really a sacred location, an indigenous location, a very important location for people, then the occupiers of Mount Moriah, who at that point in time were the Emirates, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, uh, the family of Canaanites, um, and this structure certainly was built by allies. It could not have been built by residents who occupied the mountain. It's too significant. There would not have been enough people living on the mountain. And so they would have had to call in all their allies at some point in time to build this structure. But if the structure was built specifically to block access to Temple Zero, then what is Temple Zero? Why is it so important that a people, an enemy of a people, would actually construct this massive construction to block access to a holy site? So an answer to that question is if the um, indigenous nature of the site predated the people who occupied the mountain, and it goes back according to the biblical record, to um, Jacob, Isaac, Abram, Shem, Mochitzedek, Shem being the son of Noah, then, then this site really has thousands of years of heritage attached to it and is a very, very important site to the people who descend from those who worshipped at this site and those who practiced priesthood at this site. And so um, it seems very plausible that the, um, the, the that, that this particular location is a location to which all of the forefathers, uh, Isaac, Abram, Jacob, Shem, Melchizedek, uh, were connected. And if that were true, then Israel rising out of Egypt, it would have meant that this is the place they would have been coming back to. And if there was an enemy of Israel who wanted to prevent that from happening, they would have constructed a blockage. Uh, they would have stopped anybody from coming up here. They would have broken the mountain down so that it became impossible to use. They would have obfuscated the location so that nobody could see it. And that the long history of memory uh, that may have existed in a people uh, who had been uh, exiled to Egypt for such a long period of time, 210 years, uh, perhaps that memory would have disappeared and they would not have come back to this location. Um, and so we see that there is a compelling underlying spiritual indigenous reason for uh, the existence of um, of this people and obviously their belief that this location was connected to their existence. Uh, this Matseva is very rare. There is no other like it in Israel at all. Nothing has been discovered like it. It sits on the bedrock and clearly um, if we look at the biblical record, we look at Jacob's connection with the Matseva, uh, this would have been the location that at which Jacob had his dream the night that he left Israel for Haran. Um, that was the the um, the so-called ladder, the stairway to heaven uh, that Jacob dreamed that night. He put a stone around. He put a stone down and he slept on the stone. That night there were twelve stones around his head. They all joined together and unified as one. And he and he he laid that stone as a covenant to God and said that if God brings him back to this location uh, after he goes to Haran. A successful man with wife and kids and family, uh, 
uh, if he brings him back, he will make this Beit El the house of God. Now, if this is the location of Jacob's Beit El, then um, he did come back here 20 years later. And in fact, at this location where this Matseva was uh, um, uh, located, he re-anointed the Matseva. And it's at that location that he took upon himself the name Israel. And uh, this is really where he constructed, he attempted to build and fulfill his covenant with God, which was to build Beit El, the house of God. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that we see some part of the structure, which would have existed before he left Israel, um, uh, expanded upon at the time that he came back um from Haran and um and at this point he left uh, this area and he went to uh his parents home which was south of this area in Hebron um and from there uh, a series of disasters occur until Joseph uh, is kidnapped and taken by the brothers and taken to Egypt and from there Israel is exiled for 210 years and Israel doesn't really come back to this location since uh, the time that Jacob reanointed the Matseva. Um, only when they return does Joshua attempt to uh, regain control. But by then, this entire fortress has been structured. People are entrenched. The quarry has been built. The Temple Zero complex obfuscated, probably buried. Um, and and really, uh, at that point in time, it seems pointless or fruitless to focus on this uh, acquisition, this conquering this mountain. And it takes 300 years for the tribes then to settle the land of Israel. And only after that does King David come back in his seventh year of being anointed king in Hebron. Hebron. Uh, David comes back here to unify and establish his kingdom. And this is the place that he, he comes one night to, to attack. He enters, uh, or Yoav, his, the general who was appointed because of his success in entering this complex, enters the complex, uh, uh, cuts off the water supply which ran under the ground, uh, controls the water supply into the upper city area where most of the people were living at that point in time. And by gaining control over the water supply to the city, King David then gains control over the entire city and um, uh, and establishes his base here, unifies his kingdom here, establishes his palace here on this mountain, and from there on uh, anoints his son Solomon to build the first temple. Still many questions exist, but I hope that that's uh, given you some understanding about the importance of this location and uh, why it's so compelling that we continue to excavate and open it up for the public and discover any other artifacts that may exist in the area. Thank you.